Good morning. The title of my talk today is one that begs a yes answer, which I'll show you is wrong. Is geography increasingly irrelevant in our globalized world? And you may be inclined to say, of course it is. Don't the internet, cell phones, and jet plane travel now connect everybody to everybody else and make geography irrelevant so it makes no difference whether you live in Silicon Valley or in the Central African Republic? And the real answer is no, of course not. That's nonsense. You need money in order to be able to afford a computer or a cell phone or a jet plane trick, um, ticket. But money is distributed unevenly around the world. Proportionally far more people in Silicon Valley than in the Central African Republic can afford a computer, a cell phone, or a jet plane ticket. First world countries are on the average 32 times richer than poor countries, and the richest countries like Luxembourg are 200 times richer per capita than is the Central African Republic. Why? What are the reasons for these big differences in national wealth? A big part of the answer is geography. Here's a homework assignment for you, or it's something that you can easily do to convince yourself. Just pull up on your um, computer um, a map of Africa and write down on the map of Africa the per capita, the wealth of each country, either GDP per capita or income per capita, corrected or not corrected for differences in purchasing power, any measure you want of per capita wealth. You will see that Africa is like a Big Mac in the distribution of wealth. There's a thin slice on top, the five countries in the North Temperate Zone. There's a thin slice on the bottom, the five countries in the South Temperate Zone. Those 10 countries are relatively rich, and all the countries in the middle, the center of the Big Mac, all the tropical countries in Africa are relatively poor. Those 10 temperate countries, either North and South, most of them are richer than almost any of the tropical countries in the center. What's the reason for those big differences in wealth around Africa? What's, what's the matter with being in the tropics? Well, the tropics bring three big disadvantages. One disadvantage is tropical agriculture. One has the fantasy that in the tropics it's easy to get food, bananas fall off the trees. No, that's not true. Tropical agriculture is on the average about half as productive as temperate zone agriculture. Um, and that's because tropical soils are thin and infertile. And in the tropics, there are lots of pests, year-round pests, insects and worms that destroy much of the crops. So tropical agriculture is a disadvantage. Tropical diseases are an obvious disadvantage. Tropical um, diseases are not only sad for all the people dying of those tropical diseases, but they're also bad for the economy. Tropical diseases mean a short lifespan in the tropics. Many African tropical countries have a lifespan of 50 years instead of 80 years, but if you're a trained engineer, trained at the age of 30, is gonna die at age 50, there's only 20 years to contribute to the workforce instead of 40, 50 years. Another disadvantage of those tropical diseases um, is that when you're alive, you're still out sick much of the time and not working. Women are pregnant or lactating much of the time and can't join the workforce because they're constantly churning out babies to make up for the babies who are going to die. And there's a low ratio of productive adults to non-working children. And then the third reason for the disadvantage of the tropics is the breakdown of machinery at high temperatures in the tropics. That disadvantage of being at warm temperatures, one can see within countries that span a lot of latitude. In Brazil, it's the cool temperate zone in the south that's richer than the tropics in the north, and that used to be the case in the United States as well. So that's one thing that you can see from your map of Africa, and you can easily convince yourselves. But there's another thing that you'll see from your map of Africa. Of 48 African countries, there are 33 that are on the seacoast, and one, amazing, 
and one that's on a, on a, a navigable river. But there are 15 landlocked tropical countries, 15 countries um, that do not have access to the sea and are not on a navigable river. Being landlocked is a big disadvantage for those 15 countries like Zambia and Central African Republic in the middle of Africa because transport by sea per ton and per mile is seven times cheaper than transport by land. So being landlocked is a big disadvantage. Well, you may, there's more homework for you, something that will convince you even more quickly. Take, a, take up a map of South America. South America is simple because there are only 12 countries in South America. And lo and behold, the three countries in the temperate zones, Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile, are richer than any of the nine other countries in South America which are in the tropics. In the temperate zones, even Argentina, famous for its bad government, um, if you are in Argentina, which has half of its area as the Pampas, the wonderfully fertile Pampas, so productive for grain and for cattle, um, if you're in Argentina with the Pampas, even an inefficient government can't prevent your country from becoming rich. But there's one other thing that you can see from your map of South America. I told you about the disadvantage of being landlocked in Africa. In South America, there's only one landlocked country. That's Bolivia. And lo and behold, not surprisingly, Bolivia is the poorest country in South America. All those are disadvantages of being in the, of, um, being in the tropics and of being landlocked. They are consequences of geography. Naturally, there are other factors that also affect national wealth, but geography is one of the big factors. One can wonder, does that mean that the situation for tropical countries is hopeless and that they should give up on ever achieving wealth? No, it's just as with human illness. Um, if you are ill, you go to the doctor, um, you get a diagnosis. The doctor, once you are ill, that doesn't mean that you're bound to die. The diagnosis tells you what medicine or what cure um, you can take. And similarly, being in the tropics, you can get a diagnosis. There are things that you can do and there are things you should not do in order to get rich. In the tropics, don't base your economy on agriculture. The tropical countries that have become rich, most spectacularly Singapore, Malaysia, and Costa Rica, have learned to get their money in ways other from, than from agriculture. If you're in the tropics, do invest in public health. Singapore, Thailand, and Botswana did it. Most spectacularly, Singapore that eliminated malaria and is now by far the richest tropical country in the world. If you are in the tropics, leave the exportation of agricultural products to temperate zone countries like the US, Canada, Netherlands, and Argentina. Well, one might say, so what if those tropical countries are poor? That's very sad and it's all their own fault anyway, but is that a problem for us here in temperate zone countries? 60 years ago, having poor countries out there was not a problem for rich countries because the world wasn't globalized. But today the world is globalized and it is a problem having poor countries out there, poor tropical countries, for at least three reasons. One reason is the spread of tropical diseases from poor tropical countries with low public health budgets to rich temperate zone countries on jet planes. A famous example was one, Argent one Aerolineas Argentinas flight that stopped in Peru, picked up food in Peru. The food was contaminated with cholera. The plane went on to Los Angeles and passengers from LA connected on to San Francisco, Seattle, Fairbanks, and Tokyo. And that one airplane flight left a string of cholera cases from Los Angeles to San Francisco to Seattle to Fairbanks to Tokyo. Spread of tropical diseases on jet planes. Nowadays, other ex tropical diseases that are spread on jet planes include, most notably, AIDS and Ebola, Marburg, Dengue, Chikungunya fever. But climate change nowadays means that these tropical diseases risk getting established, thanks to a jet plane flight, in temperate zone countries. And it's happening now with coronavirus um, from China. A second reason why those poor tropical countries are 
problem for temperate zone countries today is support for international terrorism by desperately poor populations in, in tropical countries that know that, that know that there's not a reasonable chance in their lifetime or in the lifetime of their children that they're going to get rich. And then, then the third problem that tropical countries, poor tropical countries, pose for temperate zone countries is unstoppable immigration by people who are going to leave. And that's especially a problem in Europe, which is face to face with Africa with one billion people, almost all of whom would be better off if they were in Europe, and they know it. So wealth varies with geography. What else is it that varies with geography besides wealth? Um, another thing is climate change. Well, you know that climate change means that the world is getting hotter, drier, and lower agricultural productivity. That's true on the average, but there are differences with geography. There are some parts of the world that paradoxically are getting cooler, like the southeastern United States, while most of the world, including us here in California, <clears throat> are getting warmer. Agricultural production in general is declining with climate change, and that's happening here in California, but agricultural production is rising in Canada, Sweden, and Britain, thanks to climate change. Sweden and Britain are now producing wine. That was not the case when I lived in Britain 60 years ago, and I can tell you that this new British wine, it's not bad, thanks to climate change. Fire hazards are, on the average, increasing around the world thanks to climate change. We know it now in California, and any of you from Australia know it even more in Australia, but fire hazards are not a consideration in Alabama. So climate change varies around the world. Another thing that varies around the world is resource problems. Resource problems vary with geography. Some countries are resource poor, and other countries are resource rich for geographic reasons. Um, the Japanese often say our country is poor in resources, and relatively speaking, that's true. On the other hand, Zambia and Iceland are rich in resources, especially rich in hydroelectric power. Zambia and Iceland produce so much electricity from hydroelectric power that they make money by their electricity. They don't need it all. Zambia exports and sells electricity to South Africa. And Iceland has so much hydroelectric power and geothermal power that it wants to do something to get money with all that ex excess power. And the Icelanders lit on the solution of aluminum. There isn't aluminum in Iceland, but they import aluminum and they use all their electricity to smelt aluminum. And aluminum is the biggest money earner the biggest foreign exchange earner of Iceland. But resource problems are going to increase around the world as the number of people around the world increases and as average consumption rates per person increase around the world. That rise in resource consumption in a world of finite resources means that we are going to see more and more resource scrambles, fights or competition for resources. A resource scramble was the background reason, was the background cause for Japan's entering World War II. I just came back from two trips to Japan where I went to the Japanese Imperial War Museum and it's there explicitly, the cause of World War II being Japan's search for over acquisition, scramble for overseas resources. Resource scrambles today are especially significant for seafood and, believe it or not, fresh water. You might say, why on earth is there a resource scramble for fresh water when we can just make fresh water from salt water? Yes, in theory and in practice, you can make fresh water from salt water, but that requires fuel, which reduce, releases carbon into the atmosphere, so you don't want to make much fresh water from salt water because that requires fuel unutilized fresh water today, something like 85% of the world's fresh water has already been utilized. The unutilized fresh water, it's unutilized because it's in remote places, notably Northwest Australia and Siberia, and there are good reasons why, reasons of access, that we're not using that little fresh water left. A scramble for fresh water that's growing, uh, uh, perhaps the most serious 
impending scramble for fresh water is with the melting of the Himalayan ice cap, but the Himalayan um, glaciers, they provide the water for the big rivers of Southeast Asia, the Mekong and the Brahmaputra and the Ganges and so on, and particularly dams upstream, for example, dams in China, are already cutting off the water supply to downstream countries so that the most productive fishery in the world, freshwater fishery in the world, the Tonle Sap fishery of Cambodia, it's already lost 85% of its production thanks to decreasing water flow in the dams upstream. Other countries where there's already a scramble for fresh water and which have come close to conflict over it include Turkey and Hungary versus Czechoslovakia and then Egypt's Nile facing problems from upstream dams. So there's another case where geography makes a difference. The last example that I wanted to give you of geography making a difference is a subtle one. And that has to do with the differences between China and Europe. Why is it that despite China's lead in technology in the Middle Ages, 700 years ago, and despite China having the world's largest population, and despite China having the seeming advantage of political unity for a long time, why is it that China has not led the world and is not, is not going to lead the world? A curse of Chinese history is what I call lurching, that China, precisely because of its unity, lurches back and forth between success and failure. China got unified, and you'll see that this is connected to geography. China was unified for the first time in, in the year 221 BC, and China has been unified on and off for most of the time since 221 BC, and is still unified today. In contrast, Europe has never been unified. Uh, Europe has always been split into today, 50 countries into the past, hundreds of different principalities. Military geniuses and political geniuses from Augustus to Charlemagne to Napoleon to Hitler, nobody has ever managed to unify Europe. Well, you might think that unity is an advantage for China and disunity a disadvantage for Europe. No, it works the opposite way. Unity means that with one person at the top, when the one person makes a good decision, that's good for the whole country, but that one person at the top, when that one person makes a bad decision, it's a disaster for the country. And that's why China lost its technological lead. China in the Middle Ages led the world in technology. It had the world's biggest ships. It had the world's best ocean-going ships, a large fleet of them. And in the, from 1405 to 1432, China sent out a fleet of, its fleet of treasure ships with 20,000 sailors on them, ships 500 feet long that dwarfed Columbus's ships. China's treasure fleet sailed out seven times to India and down the coast of Africa and it looked as if China was on the verge of rounding the tip of Africa and sailing up and conquering Europe. But it never happened. Why? Because China was unified. In 1432, China's one, empire, one emperor said, we don't need that fleet. All that that fleet does is bring us back giraffes and ivory, and we don't need that. China has everything. So in 1432, the emperor of China said, no more ocean-going fleet. That's what happens with China's unity. Contrast that with disunified, disunited Europe. There was this crazy Italian called Christopher Columbus who had the weird idea that you could sail across the Atlantic Ocean when everybody knows that at the end of the Atlantic Ocean there's an, a trench and ships will fall into the trench. So Christopher Columbus asked for support from one, another, third, fourth prince in Italy. Everybody said, you're crazy. He then went to France. The king of France said, you're crazy. Went to Spain. The king of Spain said, get lost, you're nuts. Went to Portugal. The king of Portugal said, ridiculous. Went back to Spain, tried a duke here, tried France. And finally, on the seventh try, Christopher Columbus got his ships. They were little ships. There were only three of them, but precisely because Europe was disunified, Christopher Columbus had lots of chances. China did not have the chance. Christopher Columbus crossed the Atlantic, did not fall into a trench, and the result was then a stream of Europeans going around the world with the result that the world today is Europeanized and it's not Chineseized. Is that something 
that was the case only in the past? No. China, even today, lurches back and forth between successes and failures. Uh, under Chairman Mao, um, China collectivized its farms with the result that 30 million people died, starved to death, epidemic of diabetes today as a result in China. There was the great leap forward, there was the madness of the Cultural Revolution, there was the closing down of China's educational system, sending China's teachers and professors out into the fields for two years to work next to peasants. Um, in disunified Europe, yes, there have been crazy leaders in disunified Europe, but Europe has never been had a crazy leader who had closed down the educational system and could collectivize the farms in all of Europe. That's been Europe's advantage. Um, Europe's fragmentation uh, has been paradoxically a strength for Europe by meaning competition between different countries, Hun dozens of different experiments, hundreds of different experiments, and the experiment that works best, other countries then copy. So what is all the, what is the lurching of China got to do with geography? My last homework assignment for you, just look at a map of China and compare it with a map of Europe. What's gonna strike you? You will notice that the coast of Europe is massively indented. Europe has these big peninsulas, the Greek peninsula, the Italian peninsula, the Iberian peninsula, the Danish peninsula, Scandinavian peninsula. Each of those peninsulas became a separate country, a separate language, a separate experiment. The coast of China is smooth. China's only peninsula, the Liaotong Peninsula, uh, is too small ever to become an independent experiment. Look also at islands. Europe has big islands, Britain and Ireland, each of which has become an independent experiment. China has only one island, a small island of Hainan, close to the mainland. Hainan never became significant. Look also at the rivers. China has, China has two big rivers, the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. But China's two rivers, they flow parallel, and the land between them is low. So China's two rivers were connected by canals early over 2,000 years ago. Europe's rivers, again, look at the map. Europe's, ri Europe's rivers flow out radially like the spokes of a wheel from the Alps in the center. So the Seine goes here, and the Rhone goes here, and the Rhine goes here, the Elbe goes here, and the Vistel goes here, and the Danube goes here, and the Po goes here. But each of Europe's river basins became a separate experiment, became Italy, became Germany, became France, became Hungary. Whereas in China, the, the two rivers unified China. Finally, the mountains. In Europe, there are the Alps in the center of Europe, and there are the Pyrenees separating France from Spain, and there are the Carpathian Mountains, and there are the border mountains of Scandinavia. Europe is fragmented by mountains. Um, on either side of the mountains, there are separate countries. There's France here and Spain here. There's Italy here and there's Germany here. There's Sweden here and there's Norway here. So Europe has been fragmented by its peninsulas and by its islands and its rivers and its mountains. And that fragmentation of Europe has been the strength of Europe. It means dozens, hundreds of competing experiments. While China, with its smooth coastline and its lack of significant islands and its parallel, quickly joined rivers and its lack of mountains in the central core of China, China was unified early 221 BC has been unified most of the time since then, is still unified today, and that has been and will remain the curse of China, China's unity. It means that China will continue to lurch back and forth, and we're seeing that right now, the coronavirus. Good heavens, there was already the SARS epidemic in 2004. Uh, these diseases that come to us from animals, uh, if you were a cruel person who wanted to kill as many people in the world as possible, you would foster the transmission of diseases from animals to us humans. How would you best foster it? By having open air outdoor markets where you bring wild caught animals into the market. Um, you don't just have the wild animal eaten by the hunter and just the hunter gets infected. You bring all those wild animals into a central market so you can get lots of people infected. And that was the case in 2004. You would think that that would be enough of a lesson. No, it wasn't. So we have coronavirus today. We will see how China lurches today. What it should do is close down forever all wild animal markets in the country.
but it didn't do that before, and we'll see what happens today. Uh, in short, uh, geography, despite our being in a globalized world, geography still makes a difference. It makes a difference to wealth. It makes a difference to resources. It makes a difference to the consequences of location. Uh, it makes a difference even in subtle ways like the smooth coastline. So this evening, take a look at those maps. Take a look at a map of Africa. Take a look at a map of South America. Take a look at the coastline of China. Take a look at the coastline of Europe, and you will see geography matters. Geography will always matter. Geography is the bedrock of human society. Thank you.